hope you were well fed because we have some bullshit to talk about. COVID fallout and vaccine mandates is our next panel. Um, welcome back to the stage as moderator, the Queen of Texas, Miss Carrie Smith. And I had a whole intro written for someone named Spectre. I was gonna talk about how he looks like he would be in Creed, but he didn't show up, so screw that guy. <laughs> um, next up, she is an independent journalist who has taken on big pharma, big government, corporations, the alphabet people. And she was banned from Twitter for posting a clip of the Star Spangled Banner. I think that's a, like maybe even better than my Twitter fan. Um, welcome to the stage, Savannah Hernandez. She is a writer, artist, and producer. You know her from being the editor in chief of the Post Millennial and her epic appearances on Timcast. Um, she is a fellow New Yorker, so she feels my pain. And she was once canceled from her own feminist theater group, which sounds like a good thing to me. Clap your hands for Libby Emmons! <laughs> oh shit, I forgot to say, Spectre isn't here, but Destiny is! Welcome back, Destiny! <laughs> Now, if there were a Mount Rushmore of the golden age of YouTube, her face would be on it. She is an icon. She identifies as an attack helicopter and is legally a man. Um, she is writer, commentator, documentary filmmaker, and I know that the title most important to her is wife and mother, Lauren Southern. Are you still a man though? I need to know, I can't wait. Okay, good. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, folks. Um, so in February of 2020, at the very start of the COVID crisis, Peter Daszak, a longtime collaborator with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, helped organize the infamous Lancet Letter. Uh, in the Lancet Letter, if you don't remember, 27 scientists condemned the Wuhan lab leak hypothesis as conspiracy theory and claimed not to have any conflict of interest, though some clearly did. Given all this unfolded in the past two years, I wanted to ask our panelists, how important is it today to establish the origin of COVID? Would you yeah. like to start? Hello, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I think people have, this has ruined a lot of people's lives. I think we can all attest to that. It's led to suicide, government policy has resulted in massive mental health crises, and people were told they can't ask any questions. You were banned from Facebook, many will remember this, just for saying perhaps it leaked from a lab. Of course, years later, we find, oh, maybe, possibly, they've reduced all that, taken that back. First, masks as well. We hear, don't wear them, don't buy them. That was the first messages we got from the World Health Organization, and then suddenly we get a flipperoo on that one as well. We've repeatedly gotten conflicting information whilst having our rights and liberties taken away, and now we still have zero answers for where this came from? It's ridiculous. We, people deserve answers to this, and it doesn't seem like they want to investigate it, because I think they'll find some stuff that's not too convenient for government entities. How likely is it, do you think, that we'll have answers as to the origins? I, we'll probably never know exactly where it came from. I mean, especially if it was something related to a leak in China, the idea that the United States would be able to investigate that is probably gonna be close to nothing. Um, I, I mean, we don't know now any more than we did two years ago if it came from a lab. I don't know where this idea came from, that there's like more credibility to the theory. It's just absolutely not true. Than the bat suit theory? <laughs> than the what? Than the bat soup theory? You mean where tons of viruses jump from, an is the implication that it's insane to think that like a virus could make a leap from animals there to people or? Instead of from the lab in the city where it came from that was studying specifically that disease. Are you telling me that there's a lab in a city that studies diseases that come from that city? Is that supposed to be improbable? No, I'm saying of course that adds up. It, what do you mean it adds up? That's like, uh, like 
Isn't it crazy that there are so many fire trucks around houses that are on fire? Like, yeah, of course there's going to be labs in parts of the world that are known to produce certain viruses. Like, that's why the labs are there. We wouldn't put a lab in, in the North Pole to study viruses that originate from, like, wet markets or places that tend to have a lot of coronaviruses. So it couldn't be either or, but they wouldn't let us. Or we, it could be either or. We don't know. But they wouldn't let us question one of those theories. You can call, what do you mean? Everybody has asked questions about this. Every, no, people the, the were, mainstream getting, media people publication? were getting banned from Facebook for bringing up the idea that it could have leaked I don't think you got banned for bringing up the idea. I think you get banned when you start linking a whole bunch of weird conspiratorial nonsense trying to say that we've proven 100% that Hunter Biden like fucked a pig in this no, laboratory and created getting, like the virus. I think that was the issue that we're running into. The narrative that isn't approved by the government. I would know this very well because it's happened to me myself. I've gone out on the streets of America and I've reported on things. And again, what I was banned for reporting on Leah Thomas, right? I go out on the streets of America and I talk to people and you get banned for reporting on the truth in this country, especially if it goes against the government narrative. Banned from Look what? All of the big tech social media platforms. Let's take a peek at Dr. Fauci. Homeboy literally said he was science, okay? He tried to basically say that we were not allowed to question him. We were not allowed to push back against any government narrative. Like Lauren just pointed out, people's lives were ruined over this. Children's lives were ruined over this. So we do need answers, and big tech should be held responsible, as should our government, for why this was handled so badly and where it came from. Can I ask for, you, well, Destiny, I mean, real quick, even if you don't agree with the, the likelihood that it came from the lab, do you believe that the Lancet letter was irresponsible in February 2020 to say... It's been a long time since I've read it, but I, the recollection I have of the letter was that there was no reason to believe that there was a leak from the Wuhan lab. That was my understanding at the time, but it's been a long time since I've read the exact letter. Okay, I uh, want to read the exact Facebook policy because you just claimed something that... Uh, wait, what did I just claim? You were stating that you think the only people that were really getting banned from Facebook were people posting crackpot insane theories. Oh, I don't, if you get posted, you're like, did it leak from a lab? I don't know if there's something you so banned you could, from Facebook. So you could go and you could post, uh, bat soup caused COVID without having any of your posts removed. But if you posted anything claiming that COVID was man-made or manufactured, you would have your posts removed, restricted, um, or if you were repeatedly sharing the allegation, you could lead to a ban from the site entirely. And, co and Facebook apologized for this, and they fixed it because they were wrong. I, so if you want to make the claim that if you claimed that it leaked from a lab, Facebook's made it, that's fine. But, the, but all of these conversations always get dulled back to like, we're not allowed to talk about it. We can't even ask questions. We literally weren't. That's, that's not what you, that, what you just read. That that's claim. not what that claimed. You can ask questions, but if you're sharing conspiracy theories, then yeah, they might ban you for it. I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. I'm saying that that claim is fundamentally different than the one that can, you just can said. Can I ask what your definition of conspiracy theory is? Well, I, it depends on what we're talking about, really. But no, I mean, what's like, your generally, if, if we're talking, if, if you have like a baseless theory that's just based on nothing, it usually requires some huge coordination behind the scenes of a lot of global powers that you can't like link it up. But I mean, like, it's going to depend on what we're talking about. Right? Some conspiracies are real, but I think the real issue with regard to the Lancet letter and the lab leak hypothesis and the conspiracy theories and all of that sort of thing is the amount of um, assumptions that generally were made by mainstream media outlets and social media outlets that a very specific narrative of um, COVID was correct and that uh, saying anything opposing to that was false. And there was a limiting factor in, um, those, in those assumptions that, the, that the, the narrative of COVID was that um, it originated at this wet market and then it spread around the world, that lockdowns were the appropriate way of handling it. You know, everything from masks are, of course, a way to save a lot of lives, um, which I think, you know, people are still talking about whether or not that's accurate. The issue, I think, uh, and this was true, you brought up Hunter Biden, this was true of the Hunter Biden laptop story as well. The issue was that um, it was widely believed that there was one correct way of looking at things. It wasn't even that there was one correct set of facts, but it was that there was one correct way of looking at things and that opposing that was in some way dangerous, right? So opposing the Hunter Biden laptop story saying like, oh, it was, um, that it was legitimate, uh, was legitimate reporting that Emma Jo Morris did at the Post saying that was con contrary to the mainstream narrative and that in some way it was dangerous to say that. So um, I think that's more the issue as opposed to where the virus originated and how it originated. The trail on that is so cold. There's no way that we're ever going to find that out. Uh, the World Health Organization was trying to find that out. They sent people in 
uh, my timeline is all screwed up, but in my brain it was relatively recently, um, and there was no way to find anything. There's just, whether it matters or not where it originated, there is no going back and discovering that. Well, I have a follow-up question to that. So. In 2014, the Obama administration suspended gain-of-function research after a series of lab accidents involving pathogens at CDC headquarters in Georgia. Uh, some of the National Institute for Health funding that was funneled to the Wuhan lab in China went towards manipulation of bat coronaviruses. Should we have an international treaty to ban gain-of-function research? Absolutely not. It's, a, it's essential research that you have to do on viruses to see how they mutate. It's part of the, it's how we can get ahead of like flu season viruses to know which vaccines to make. Um, the idea that we just ban some forms of research, uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand it. Just, I, I, don't think it I don't think it's a reasonable way forward. I think it's an important part of what we do to figure out like which viruses are going to mutate in which ways and then how to prepare the public for these viruses. I, I totally agree with that. I think that there's, um, I don't think that there should be a ban on scientific research really. Um, I think there should be bans on experimentation on, on human subjects, and I think we do have those. Likely, though, there should be a lot more safeguards with regard to um, how these labs are secured. Uh, for example, why were we funding a bunch of, um, why were we funding labs internationally in places where, the, you know, why was the government funding those labs in places where they could not secure them, where they could not make sure that there were safeguards in place? That's something that I think is interesting. Why were we funding gain-of-function research in China when we were prohibiting it, um, prohibiting it here in the U.S.? That's weird, right? I mean, I think the goal of funding is that, like, the United States, the CDC, we want to work with countries around the world when it comes to pathogen research. We would prefer to have our expertise shared with them and that knowledge shared with us rather than allowing everybody to independently work on things. It's just, I think that's how our public health functions. I think it's probably better for it, right? If they're making important discoveries or if they're, you know, doing whatever research they're doing, we want to have some hand in that, whether to contribute our own knowledge or to learn something from them. But also, we're still working on the assumption that, like, that there, or it sounds like that, like, the virus was leaked or there weren't safety precautions taken. My understanding is these labs have a lot of safety precautions. That's, like, part of, like, what the U.S. funding goes towards. That's going on in Ukraine now, right? Like, that's part of what the funding is. There are, is yeah, there the, are countries all over the, the world that we fund, like, medical research in. Yeah. U Ukraine is one of those as well, yeah. Savannah, do you think the response to COVID in the past two years did more harm than good? 100%. And I think we've all seen that. Um, again, I watched Shelley Luther, who is a Dallas salon owner, get arrested and put in jail because she had the audacity to make sure that her bills were paid, paid and more importantly, her employees' in, uh, bills were paid. I just got back from Skid Row. I talked to a lot of the uh, people who run the missions down there who said that the homeless population has exploded since the government lockdowns because of COVID. People are homeless now. Uh, we saw a rise in that. We saw a rise in um, just so many bad things in this country, uh, again, like uh, children's lives were ruined, people's lives were ruined, they couldn't pay their bills, lockdowns did not work in any capacity, just like face masks. I mean, look at where we're at right now, okay? The face mask uh, mandate was lifted, everybody took them off. Uh, Lauren and I were talking about this earlier, it's like, okay, are we gonna see this big surge in COVID? And you know, we could debate why we won't be seeing that now, but uh, again, just a lot of these lockdown measures made absolutely zero sense. This is a virus with the 99% survival rate. We're trying to vaccinate children who would have a pretty much a 0% mortality rate against this if they had no underlying conditions. The measures that we took were abhorrent and we ruined people's lives for no reason. What's weird is uh, the mask mandate is lifted in New York City for all citizens except for those between the ages of two and four. Yeah. So at daycare centers, you have to make sure that the children are masked. And it doesn't actually, it doesn't seem to make any sense. So my son can go to school with no mask, which he's grateful for and I'm grateful for, um, but three-year-olds can't. And of course, that's the population that finds it the most difficult to keep them on their faces. And again, too, I, I just want to go back and remember everything that we all went through, right? We were arresting people that were in California surfing alone on the beach by themselves. I think a lot of us forgot how ridiculous these measures were. Measures were. Apologies, guys, my brain's slow. I just got back from California. <laughs> remember that we were filling up skate parks with sand because we didn't want people outside 
you know, exercising, going and uh, the government was not pushing exercise or supplements or anything that would actually help you get a better immune system. What were they pushing? Big pharma medication to, uh, you know, help those nine new billionaires that were created in 2020. I, they okay, locked, I think they locked I, the, up playgrounds. I, I found that I found that to be so surprising. Like the the playgrounds were actually locked; you couldn't get into them. Gyms were closed, bars were open. So were casinos, but churches can, were closed. I, I think the issue is that there is there is no sane position on your side of the political aisle for somebody that is criticizing these lockdowns to join. I think that there were times where around the world and in the United States where there were some policies that were pretty dumb or there were some things that went too far. All of us have gone into a restaurant and worn a mask for two steps and then sat down and taken it off, which I agree is silly. There were a lot of silly policies, but in order for me to acknowledge that and then hop over, the company that I find myself in are people saying that like, we should have went to the gym and had supplements instead of relying on big pharma for making billionaires with vaccines or whatever. Or that like mask mandates and everything don't help or don't do anything. We can all look at the stats. Do you, you, look do you at the not top believe 15, in natural immunity? If you look, yeah, but natural immunity doesn't come from going to the gym or having supplements, right? Hey, no, but the I important in part that I am talking about is that being very healthy, going to the gym and taking care of your body would have been much more beneficial to your reaction in recovering from COVID-19 than if you were morbidly obese. Seven, I believe it was over 70% of the people that were hospitalized for COVID-19 were obese. Is the implication that if we would have kept gyms open for the first time in human history, Americans would have started working out? Because I don't think that was going to be the realistic alternative. But we're keeping people inside. Okay, like, uh, I think we can agree on this, right? You go outside in the sun, that's healthy for everybody. You get your vitamin D, that's good and healthy just for your human body. Yeah, but then you we also increase your exposure inside. to viruses. That was the whole Wait, point. Outside no, 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 no. in the sun, home? Are you freaking serious, dude? You're one of those that thinks that standing outside in the hot sun, you're going to catch COVID-19 I don't from think that? standing outside was the problem. The issue is when people go to gyms, you go to bars, you go to restaurants and everybody's together and then they get sick. That's how viruses transmit from one person to another, what, yeah. What's your but, opinion, Destiny, on, on the arbitrary nature of some of the lockdowns? Because as Savannah's pointing out and, and some of the other ladies, the gyms were closed, I, but liquor lo stores stayed were, open. I think that it's difficult to do public policy public health policy and it's difficult to collect good data on what works and what doesn't work. Like there are still people today that think that like masks have no impact on the transmission of a virus, which is which the way other we're countries wearing have, them, absolutely not. What? Cloth masks and the way we're wearing them, almost no. No effect. They absolutely almost have. There, there, the there's size there's of the studies have shown they are ninety percent ineffective when they're cloth masks. Most people don't even wash their cloth masks when they wear them, most surveys are showing. And the cloth mask itself does not stop COVID. Yes, it can stop like literal someone spitting on you, but it's not stopping COVID. The particles are too small. So the way we're wearing them, the type of masks we're wearing, and how we're treating them, completely ineffective. I, I don't think they're completely ineffective. I'm pretty sure there have been like large studies. It's not if enough If you're wearing on its a proper... Own, it's not, you don't have to have an N95. No, it's not the just that. The cloth masks do right? not... They're, it's it, every little bit Very, like very six, minimal sure, to the point where it doesn't... Sure, but it's that in combination with vaccines, in combination with distancing, in combination... Well, of course, There's if you like add one... the things that actually work, like distance, oh, suddenly, look, masks work. Well, of course. It's all powered that with an effective The CDC went from six feet of social distancing to three feet of social distancing. The science was never consistent. And you're talking about masks and vaccines, but you can get vaccinated and still spread COVID-19 to your fellow vaccinated person. Can you please explain that for me? Yeah, the, a vaccine is not 100% effective, but the chances okay, of you we spreading it, the it chances safe of, and hold effective, on. I know, and that is hold why on. they were trying to mandate it and force Americans for to shut down our entire you... country. I'm apologi I am apologize that I'm getting a bit angry about this, but uh, I have watched small businesses get shut down. People cry because, you know what, they can't feed their family, and it's because the government tried to force us to take an experimental vaccination that has verifiably given people myocarditis, pericarditis, many side effects, why, and you want to sit here and tell why, me it's okay, safe and why, effective? Absolutely not. Nothing is more funny to me than conservatives that will get on stage and they'll talk about the virus is a 99% survival rate. Very few people die. Myocarditis and pericarditis, these instances are happening like six out of 100,000 vaccinated I thought cases. one death was too these much, which is why we locked I mean, down. I always said one death was too much. Did I say, are you talking to somebody else? But you know, none of us are talking to you. No, 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 I'm so, not talking to you. The point. So when, so the reason why we locked down was just oh, one sorry, death. Am I not, am I not allowed to talk over here? Go ahead. Can you, can you respond to it? And actually, sorry, and friends, I'm a bit hyped up. It's related to what you're saying. Businesses shut down. It was tragic, right? And action by the government caused economic harm for sure. But we also seem to ignore all of the harm that was actually caused by the virus. We are sitting up here crying about like the, the very, very, very few people that might get myocarditis, which is mild inflammation of the heart. Not all of these people are dying. It's not a permanent condition. It's not chronic. There but are we children have that have myocarditis have, right now. And you want to overlook have, that? There are student athletes that are having their lives permanently altered. And you want to overlook that? Do you, why do you want to overlook the one million people that died from the coronavirus? That's the 
statistic, overblown. Oh my goodness! If anything, it's underblown. We can look at the over uh, the um, the. So oh, the you get coronavirus, right? You're morbidly single, obese, so you so, don't. You're okay. not able to fight the virus it's, it's, as well as no, you would have been able to. to do with if fighting. you went to the gym and you actually took care of your health. But we have people advocating here for face masks and vaccination, and why is that? Because the. This entire country is a gigantic okay, really money I'm really curious. This entire like, I'm really big curious. pharma vaccination I just, I ask, thing okay. was a giant so money-making scheme. Believe, you don't believe any of the data relating to vaccines or how many people got sick, but you do, do believe. I trust you do the believe government the data, and the data that they put out? Absolutely the data, not. You, but you do believe the data about like myocarditis or pericarditis. No, when you see I think a study that that's like that, underreported. Like, oh my God, absolutely. No, I know that's underreported. Actually, let me let me interject for a second. Who do you? You guys, it's hard for people to hear when we're yelling over each other. So just to know, I've been out there before, and it's very hard to hear. Just kicked in, guys. Sorry. So. Just let me in. just try and refocus this for a second. We'll bring Can it down. Can I ask her one question? But, I just yeah, but let me she... ask my question first. Okay, go for it. You're the moderator. I have, I'm in the middle. So, <laughs> do you think that there are any circumstances under which the government should be able to enact lockdowns where they prevent people from going to work, uh, where they prevent kids from going to school, small businesses from operating? And that's I, a question for everyone. I, would, I, I think that the real issue was not whether or not all of this works, whether or not vaccines work. Uh, vaccines were made available to all of us. I don't know how many of us took them. Um, I was sort of fine with it, plus my mom really pressured me. But um, I think the issue was that it did not look like we had a lot of choices. It did not look like we were being given all of the information, right? So when you asked a question, are these vaccines safe? What about these different issues that I have concerns about? The answer was stop asking those questions, just take the vaccine. Um, so if you wanted to take the vaccine, sure, take it. If you didn't want to take the vaccine, you suffered penalties. There are still police officers in New York City who are um, at risk of losing their jobs because they are refusing to get vaccinated. This is still ongoing. Um, you know, I was just talking to some officers last week about this. So, and also the issue with regard to lockdowns. Do you want to keep your business open? The answer was, you don't get to make that determination. And I think that's sort of the fundamental issue for me with COVID was how little information the public, um, the government felt the public was entitled to receive and how little choice we had in any of these matters. In New York City also, which I'm obsessed with because I live there, uh, children were required to be vaccinated in order to go out to eat at dinner but they weren't required to be vaccinated to go to school. It was sort of a weird situation there. Uh, there were a lot of inconsistencies. I think we saw also um, that protests against lockdowns were considered, you know, these horrible alt-right things, but protests for black trans lives, for example, in front of the Brooklyn Museum of Art in, I think, June 10th of 2020 was perfectly acceptable. And you had like the mayor out there being like, yay, let's do this. Libby, can so I just pop there in was, and say, do you remember was, when there were headlines that were saying that BLM uh, rallies were not super spread yes, events? Yes, you had a lot of doctors justice. sign a letter saying that BLM rallies were um, not super spreader events. You had a situation where Governor Andrew Cuomo, I don't know if you remember him, he was run out by his progressive colleagues and then not actually charged with any of the things they said he did. He's been cleared of all wrongdoing. Um, but he went out and he said that um, when doing contact tracing, do not ask anybody if they had been to um, uh, BLM protests. So it was. It, there were a lot of contradictions. And for me, that was the issue. I don't have any issue with the government saying, here's some vaccines. This is, this is what we intend to this is what they are intended to safeguard against. Uh, these are some ideas that we have on how to protect us all. The issue that I had was that Americans were infantilized, treated as though we were stupid, and not permitted to make our own decisions. Yeah. I think um, the, the inconsistencies of how this is being applied and the macro question of what are we willing to give up to have, what right to health do we have? Do we have a right to be protected from other people who have the cold? Do we have a right to be protected from other people who may fill up the hospital because of their personal decisions? That was obviously a huge question throughout all of this. If you brought up, okay, well, you're vaccinated. I'm not. Why can't we just stay that way? You've made your decision. You're protected in the way you want to be, and I want to do my thing. And the comeback to that was always, well, you're going to fill up hospitals, and therefore your personal decision is affecting all of us. And 
that's why we need this government mandate. Well, that applies, I'd say, even more so to obesity, to drug addiction, to all of these cases that we see every day massively taking up uh, fire departments, police departments, uh, ambulances, time, it, way more. It would be drug addiction and obesity than COVID. So where are the government mandates and policies saying, you can't be fat? <laughs> Uh, outlawed. You're going straight to the camps to work out. Where are the government policies, you know, oh, we're not going to help you anymore because you're a drug addict. You made that decision. We heard this time and time again. You're not vaccinated. You get COVID. We should stop helping those people. I don't see any of those talking Conservatives have literally pushed government, that wasn't the government decision. trying to say that, like, That was if people you, on Twitter saying that. The government didn't do that yeah, or that. Yeah, so people, where were the people saying that? They're, right. Yeah, I mean, the you, other way around. You do it's have, the hypocrisy from both the government policy. They don't have any policy like that towards obesity. There but they are do a lot the of vaccines. there are places where there's taxes on like soda, for example, extra sure. taxes in order to try and prevent obesity. I was gonna say, Steven, you conservatives have, a have literally pushed like to drug test welfare recipients and stuff before. So it's not like this is unheard of when it comes to punishing people. For, Wasn't that the 90s? That was the 90s. That, they've, they've tried it several times over the past couple of The problem is every time they try it, it ends up, you end up wasting more money drug testing people than you would have saved by not drug testing them anyway. But I'm saying, like, we have tried to also, in the United States, drugs are, are illegal. So if you do drugs, drug you do go to jail for it. For it. We, haven't made, um, we haven't made obesity legal yet. But you have to admit, there's, like, it's, it's far harder to police somebody's, like, weight than whether or not they've gotten vaccinated. Not to say that like you have to agree that one is good and one isn't or whatever, but to just compare the two and to say like, oh, well, you know, if you could get vaccinated, you could also just lose 150 pounds, right? Like the, one requires an dr incredibly dramatic lifestyle change and the other is going to, you know, a CVS for 15 minutes. But there are these inconsistencies in the logic and there is the question that if, if we really want, like in some countries, like New Zealand, even China, they're saying we want a zero policy. We don't want anyone getting COVID, right? When you get to that mindset of oh, our rights have so little importance compared to our right to be healthy or, you know, how the government feels we should be healthy, right? Um, eventually it's going to push into these other categories as well and we're going to find we've lost a whole hell of a lot of freedom. We've lost the right to even live for the sake of staying alive. I, yeah, I mean, it's a difficult question to answer, but I remember at the beginning of the, I, at the beginning of this pandemic, I don't remember who it was, but somebody, probably, it might have even been a nature study that said that, um, like, the upper bound, the upper bound, if we did nothing to stop the coronavirus, would have been, like, two or three million deaths, and this was, like, universally lauded by all the conservatives on Twitter, everybody in the media is joking that that's not going to happen, and now here we are a couple years later, and we've exceeded a million deaths, and that's with all of the crazy lockdowns that's, and everything that we've put globally, into place. That's right? That's a global number, a million? Or is that no, the that's US in the United number? States. Over okay. one million people in the United States have died from it. So now it doesn't really seem like it was that unlikely that had we done nothing, that number might have far exceeded two or three million. million. COVID. Right? Do you know when I got COVID and my whole family got COVID? It was during the peak of our lockdowns. So like, I, I think a lot of the stuff we did for lockdown, and we're looking at it now, we're looking back at a lot of our policies, whether they be mask mandates, Australia just did a bunch of research on their COVID safe app, finding it was highly ineffective. The people who actually needed to use it weren't using it. We're looking back, we're going to look back at it the way that People were doing things to prevent the bubonic plague as strange, conspiratorial, bizarre, going back and forth. A lot of the data and a lot of our actions were just, we were flailing. You literally, if you're from Australia, you could literally watch the numbers. Like, we can all go and you can Google coronavirus Australia numbers and you can see that, like, the virus flares up, a whole bunch of lockdown shit goes into measure, and the virus goes away. You like, can look, you can look at the opposite effect. Where's been the giant spike in Florida? Where's been the giant spike since, you know, airlines removed mask mandates? Are we you can see try that? to find anomalies, but where the data no, is No, 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 you can well, find anomalies. I don't data, have to try. Where the data was collected well and where the most stringent measures were put into to place, this is where the virus tended to recede. Like, it's hard to tell in Florida, like, well, where was the spike? We don't even know how many cases there were in Florida because how many people get sick and they don't actually well, do testing. Well, then the data itself is extremely flawed, right? You have people you getting counted as COVID all you want, deaths you that can just look, died with can, COVID, and that's, can, like, admittedly so from these institutions. At, if you look at, like, the top 15 states for coronavirus deaths per 1 million, I'm pretty sure, like, 12 or 13 of them are red states, right? It's not an accident. If you look at countries that enacted strict lock... Hold on. What is the temperature? How many people here think that lockdown measures did nothing to prevent the spread? Does anybody believe that up here? Okay, so you agree that they helped a little I, bit, right? So to, to, I, I think there was they were an interesting more damaging thing than helpful. An, uh, and again, my only information is New York, but there was a there was an interesting thing in New York where during lockdowns, people were prevented from. And in New York, we don't really have 
people over, like nobody comes over to your house because um, you don't really have a very big house. But what happened in restaurants and stuff, restaurants were closed, clubs were closed, bars were closed, and so people were going to each other's homes. And at a certain point, it was like 74% of the spread of COVID was in personal homes. So it was interesting. I would be interested to know what that difference would have been. Like, would it have been 74% in homes? Would that same 74% have been in public spaces? Or would there have been less spread in public spaces? Sure, but I mean, like, even for New York, we can look at what happened when New York put in the biggest lockdown measures, right? The cases fell off a cliff. Like, the data is on your phone. You can Google, like, coronavirus New York and look at, like, I'm looking the up capita. the top states. I'm super curious. <laughs> I'm, I'm still I, curious about whether you guys, uh, is, this, is this a disagreement about whether the government has the right to lock down businesses and prevent people from going to work? No. Or, there, is, it a, it, or is it a disagreement about what, where that threshold is? Like, at, at, is it just that COVID, for those of us who didn't agree with lockdowns, is it that COVID didn't meet that threshold for us? Do you, do you Savannah, believe the government ever has a right to say, okay, lockdowns, no one goes to work? I really don't, and I don't think that, because look at what is happening in Shanghai. Okay, you give the government an inch and they take a mile. And Destiny, I do want to go back to a lot of these statistics that you're bringing up, because um, there's this book, right? It's called How to Lie with Statistics, one of Bill Gates' favorites. And you bring up and you keep saying, one million people died from COVID. One million people died from COVID. Did they die from COVID, or did they have you know, other comorbidities, and did they die with COVID? Also, a lot of these PCR tests were faulty. I have a couple of friends who have uh, you know, taken the at-home COVID test or gotten at-home COVID test. They will put tap water on the test, and it will test positive. Carrie Mullis, the creator of the PCR test, even talked about how the test itself was faulty. So you keep talking about these statistics, you keep talking about these specific states, but even look at the demographic of the people. If there's a population where the demographic is older, there's going to be higher death rates, right? Because we can all agree that uh, maybe older people who do get COVID-19 are more susceptible to dying. So we do need to take that into account when you are just throwing out these statistics because you're throwing out big, scary numbers, just like CNN and MSNBC did to keep us all locked down for the past two years. But we really need to look into, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts of what these statistics really entail. The other okay, thing too, wait, though, what? is with the, with the, the other question about the statistics is, whatever those are, could there ever be any statistics that justify these kind of measures? Absolutely not. For, okay, firstly, if you want to look at like excess mortality, we can look around the world and we can see that if anything, the deaths due to the coronavirus were probably underreported. This has been agreed upon basically universally. Number one. Number two, saying that comorbidities are present and that's why people are dying only makes sense to have more stringent lockdowns. When you try to say something like, well, being okay, overweight is a Okay, lockdown the obese and lockdown me, people. People who over, have, you know, um, other conditions as well can choose to stay home. Why are you going to put a face mask on and lock down a healthy individual? That makes absolutely no sense. I got COVID-19, and I'll say this and I'll let you respond. I got COVID-19, right? I purposely did not go to the doctor and get any treatment because I wanted to prove that if you are a healthy individual with no underlying conditions, you will be able to survive this virus easily, which I did. So why are we locking down the majority of the country who is healthy, who does not have underlying conditions for this smaller majority. The reason why, first of all, the majority of Americans have a comorbidity because being overweight what is a comorbidity. Okay. Okay. So, so one, you're wrong on right. that, number one. Number two, so what's that, number what's two that percentage? the reason why all of society has to be bought into a particular thing is because it doesn't make sense to have a no shitting section in a swimming pool. Nobody wants to be in that pool, and that's what our public health policy is about. You can't have half the population ignoring it and the other half of the population following it because all of these things are a big stats game. It's all a big numbers game. If you only have 20% of your population vaccinated, and as you said, vaccinated people can still get sick, it doesn't really work well. That's the challenge of public health policy. That's the challenge of doing these things. It has to affect every single person in the country in order for it to be effective. Okay, so you seem to be willing to acknowledge with the obesity question when Savannah brought up, oh, why don't we, you know, force people to go to the gym? Why don't we open gyms for people so they can get fit and healthy? I want to have an obesity it? tax. I'm well, all no, in favor of you, that. You, you kind of were, were flippant and said, oh, really? You think we're going to get Americans to go to the gym? Which, fair enough, fair enough. But for some reason, you're not so flippant when people make the absolutely absurd suggestion that we can lock down and not be with our friends and family for years and years on end. Of course that is going to fail, just like the suggestion that we're going to get never a ton that. of Americans of course, of, to go Of course it's difficult. A lot of people It's not difficult. It's impossible to well, the point that most 
possible to, because to the point really that most of these policies were extremely ineffective because of people not following them. Like you saying, people are going and they're spreading it in their homes because they're having dinner with their friends. No, she said people 74 percent of the disease was spread in the homes, but we don't know. But the actual amount of people getting sick fell. So of course, the higher percentage is going to be spread. Most in homes of these policies only worked if they were followed properly, much like the mask mandate all over the world. Lockdown happens, it's spreading anyways, because humans That's need not connection. What you they just need said, to go to work, true? they need to do all of these the things that were in taken away from us for years. In every single state where lockdowns were mandated, the spread decreases. And then but it, like conservatives as soon as, lose their as mind, soon and like, they had oh, well, to open look, up like, because you know, people needed to go to work, people needed to see their families, everyone just got it again. Sure, and the goal and is to You know what probably would have been a lot easier to rip that Band-Aid off early? That's easy for you to say because you don't spend time working inside a hospital or you don't have families that are getting sick from other things. Our entire hospital system has been stressed. It was do, before do the you coronavirus. Work in a hospital? I'm Did in the you middle in of talking. Holy shit. Okay. During coronavirus? The, entire, the entire hospital system was stressed for, for before we even got to the coronavirus pandemic. And if you talk to any medical professional for the past two years, it's been hell. People are being shipped in from Canada to work as traveling nurses. Oh, yeah. Like every, like, I, I disagree it, with that. It, like, th there's been a huge burden <laughs> on the system. The idea that we could have just, oh, we'll just do it all at once and have a huge hump of people. When we already had over a million people die from the disease, I don't think it's an effective it's, it, way it, or an appropriate way to manage it's public close, health. It's close to a million. It's, I looked it up. It's nine... 990,000. The official number is higher than that. Really? It is Steve, over 1 I million. just looked it up. But, but also, also no, no, no. That, that, that number the, is probably an underreport, is what most people The agree. CDC said, I think the CDC said that there was um, overreporting in some cases. Absolutely not. Absolutely really? not. Who was it who was saying that recently? Because I read some reports. I don't know on that. who you watch for media, but it, it, the CDC, absolutely, nobody has said that there's been an, under, there, an, an overreporting of deaths. Steve, the, do you think that the COVID containment discussion has disappeared from media? Because. I think a lot of people do, do you know, and, if, you know what, and if you think it has disappeared, do you, why do you think that is? Do you know what killed, you know what killed COVID? Is it, she's going to say Ukraine. Yeah. War in Ukraine. It took it right off my TV set. Well, it's yeah. also, also the midterms watch. this year. But Let's it not took forget it right that, away. too. The, it, it's sort of interesting. Um, I, I think that these conversations, uh, I think we do miss the, like, obviously COVID had a major health impact on the United States and the world. Obviously, it sucked and it was bad for a lot of people. I got COVID. I, it was very unpleasant. I had to miss this event in November. I didn't die, obviously. I'm still here. But um, I think that the real issue is the amount of um, oppression that we got from the government. I think the clampdown on our rights was a problem. I think that we let that happen without a lot of pushback was a problem. And I think the... Um, uh, when it turned out that questioning the going narrative um, would get you, you know, people got fired or people got banned from social media. Media outlets wouldn't allow that stuff to be covered. Google suppressed it. I remember that from the post-millennial. We had, you know, we would run stories of somebody questioning the narrative um, and that would get like suppressed and it was a big problem, fact-checked, all of those sorts of things. So the real issue, I mean, yes, COVID was a big problem. Yes, the lockdowns were a big problem. To me, the biggest problem was the uh, oppressive nature of government control. The, the intelligent and interesting conversation that needs to happen is we have to figure out what is an appropriate response given the likely damage of a particular virus. And I think that hopefully when we go back and look at everything, we're going to find that some things probably worked pretty well, and we're going to find that some things were probably incredibly stupid and didn't work well. This is a conversation right. that I wish we could have, but instead, we're having conversations about experimental vaccines and the Wuhan lab gain of function Fauci research leak. And it's all of just like this highly irrelevant stuff. Most of it is highly untrue, uh, to be kind. Um, and it diverts the conversation away from like, I think the interesting stuff that we could be talking about. Was there an appropriate amount of stimulus? What, like, which lockdown measures were effective, which weren't? And I think these are the yeah, conversations I think that I wish we were having instead. wanting to have these like, oh, let's talk about the interesting like data and stats here. And there's a lot of emotion on this, I mean, women, right? So there's a lot of emotion on this side of the uh, conversation, but also because we go outside, you spend 90% of your time inside playing video games on your computer. You don't okay, really you travel. Are literally <laughs> like, you're not that affected by COVID policy. <laughs> okay. So number one, you're wrong. Okay. I'm not, I know for a fact. Number you, one, I log wrong. in any time of the day. Oh, Destiny's live playing Elden Ring, playing League of Legends. <laughs> so I was actually separated from my fiance for 10 months. I could not see her because of coronavirus lockdown policy. It's probably the hardest part of But you're playing religion, video games okay? the whole time anyway. So. Does, well, sometimes people like to do other things too, believe it or not, Lauren, okay? So 
yes, it did affect me. It had a huge effect on me. That was. Oh, that it was, just that, gave you more time to play league. You were like, was, sick. was she in a different country? You were just talking yes, about how Swedish, hard it was so to be separated from friends and family. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and he just said that he was separated from his fiance. Oh, for no, I'm 10 saying months. It, it gives him more time to play video games. So he right, probably but she's like doing so. an ad hominem personal attack. He's pretending to be emotional for me, okay? I I don't, the let it, to don't let him yeah. humanize yeah. himself. I want the moderator to turn no, this down, okay? We're all, we're all humans. It's it was a, thing. it was a, it was a, it was pretty funny as a joke, but I feel personally attacked. Okay, we're. I do want to, I do want to ask a question though about something you said. You said it's irrelevant. Do you, do you not to go? And back and beat a dead horse, but I guess I didn't realize this at the beginning. You think it's irrelevant for us to to definitively find out where the virus originated, or you think it's impossible to find I, out? I think it's probably impossible, and then I don't know how relevant it would be if we found out one way or another. I don't know what that changes going forward in the future. Like, um, like hypothetically, like ultra worst case scenario, say like China manufactured the virus and it got out of control and it like you know they were trying to mess with us. Like what like what are we doing about it at this point? I mean, I guess it would be good to know, but I, I just I don't know like what policy actions we take in the future to based on there, like the there origination. could be trade there could be trade policy changes based on that for sure. But are there right? I mean, no, you've got like all of be. Europe right there now is be. talking about how evil Russia is. Right. Meanwhile, they're heating their homes with sure. Russian gas that they don't want to get rid of. Right? Is the United States really about to start sanctioning you know I China? Think we, I think we only just stopped importing because we had futures. I think we only just stopped importing it's Russian. It's destiny. And if I Russian could ask oil. you a question too. So am I, wait. Well, no. Am I going to be allowed to answer or? Okay, then go ahead. Yeah. All right. So I think just from my own opinion, and feel free, of course, to respond to this one, that the reason why it's important for us to figure out where this comes from is, for example, let's say uh, that Dr. Fauci's uh, National Institute of Infectious Diseases, uh, you know, did fund gain-of-function research, and then the same Dr. Fauci was allowed to lead the entire public policy that was pushing vaccination on the public, that was, you know, uh, basically hiding the fact that Dr. Fauci, because this is what a lot of these conspiracy theorists on the right would say, right? That uh, Dr. Fauci funded this virus, that it got released, and then Dr. Fauci, who was making money off the same vaccines that were supposed to be saving us from the virus, uh, okay. was allowed to, you know, be Dr. able to Fauci lead that public policy. So I'm not finished with my question yet. My okay. question would be, if that was something that did happen, don't you think that would kind of be important to know and like moving forward, maybe for the direction of our country, not let people be allowed to do that in yeah, our government? My understanding is I don't think Dr. Fauci unilaterally controls the budget of his department. Now, I could be wrong. Maybe he's literally the only one that does that. I would be surprised if that was the case, number one. Number two, I don't think Fauci has made a ton of money off of the vaccine. Do you think that Fauci or any, any political leaders will ever be held accountable for their role in our, the COVID response? I, what, what is accountability? Like, what, the, the, this is the issue, is that like, we have a virus that was more transmissive than any virus in the history of all of mankind. This is like the biggest like, worldwide like, spread of a virus we've ever seen, ever. So in terms of, like, is somebody going to be held accountable for messing up? Like, I mean, I don't even know if people knew what we were supposed to do, right? This, I mean, we like didn't if have, you like, intentionally a funded, uh, you know, like, genetically modifying this virus to infect humans easier, don't you think that that should be something you should be held accountable should, we, for? I'm not saying that happened. I'm saying, do you, like... Should, do we, no, stop, hypothetically. Do you want to stop all gain of function research? No, I don't think so, but I think that okay, if so you if it happened funded and there was that a mistake, and you had bad intentions behind it, don't you think that you should be held accountable? If that you was the case, that. yeah, of course. If Fauci is, is twirling his mustache behind the scenes trying to engineer a virus to destroy the world in order to get rich off of vaccines, yeah, that would probably be something worth looking into. When I see evidence of that, I'll be more interested in that. How are I we going to see evidence if we don't investigate any of this? I'm pretty sure if anybody in Congress wanted to open an investigation, or we have the wonderful independent journalists Just from like places Rand like Paul, Project who was Veritas. Censored off of and YouTube after trying to push Fauci on is this YouTube the only place issue? where investigative journalism can happen? No, is that, is I'm that really where we're at today? We are like, silencing people that are trying to push back and expose this, aka Rand Paul, who was pushing back against Dr. Fauci. Rand Paul is literally in Congress. I don't think he's been silenced. He has his little moments in his hearings. He gets mainstream media coverage from everybody when he's asking his little questions. Like, I, it seems like he's doing okay. I don't know how his YouTube channel is doing, but it seems like he's been able to ask the questions that he wants to ask. You keep pointing on the YouTube side, but what I'm pointing to is the fact that uh, that's public information that we should all have access to, correct? What, which, if Fauci was engineering viruses? Just even that information. Don't you feel like we should have freedom of information to even access that conversation between Dr. Fauci and Rand Paul? Um, if you want. I mean, you can file a FOIA request and see if you can get it declassified. Okay, or so you if want you're to. an average American citizen who has no idea what a FOIA request is because you didn't go to school for journalism, go ahead and do that if you want to access to the information about corruption in this country. I, I don't know what the point of that question was. There are journalists that can file FOIA requests if you want to. I'm not t saying that the average American should be the one in charge of doing these investigations. But that's the whole reason why we have investigative journalists, right? But I'm pointing out that that's why right? it's so... Uh, 
like bad that we have censorship right on YouTube because it gives the average American the ability to access this information that they otherwise would have had to, uh, you know, a journalist would have had to go through a FOIA request for to get. Uh, like, I don't understand why you're arguing for the government to be able to cover things up right now. I'm not arguing for the government to be able to cover things up. You're arguing about a cover-up of a thing that I don't think ever even happened. I don't think there's any evidence pointing towards it happening. So we're like in two different worlds of what we're talking about right now in terms of... But that's what I'm saying. It's like there was even a conversation about that, right? But you can't even access that conversation conversation, the average American person, if they're interested in that, if they're interested in, hey, maybe I do want to become an investigative reporter, where would I start on this? You can't even have, like, the access to information on I how this discussion started. I don't know what the rationale started. was for, what the, like, there are certain meetings that are closed-door meetings that are inaccessible to the public for yeah. matters of national security, for matters of stuff going on within Congress. I don't know why this particular conversation was classified. If you don't think it should have been, then you file a FOIA request, and that's the process that we go through. But the alternative, we don't just have every single conversation open to the public. That's just not how our government works. So it sounds like... You answered my question earlier. You don't think the government has a right to enforce lockdowns for any reason. Um, you think they do. I'm not sure about you ladies, where, where you fall on that. I, didn't, but, I did not think that they were appropriate measures. And my right. specific concerns with the lockdowns were um, the closure of small businesses and the closure of schools, which any parent knows was not only devastating for... Um, children in terms of their learning, but they lost a lot of learning, they lost a lot of socialization, and there were, uh, there, I'm pretty sure there was, uh, anecdotal evidence will suggest that there was an increase in childhood obesity due to the pandemic, because we couldn't go out and go to the, we couldn't go to the playgrounds, we couldn't go play, we couldn't do a lot of things, um, and it was extremely frustrating for my son in particular. Honestly, if it weren't for um, video games and being able to like play online with his friends, it would have been even more devastating. Absolutely so, so based, I want, true. <laughs> so I want to ask a question. That is that is true. <laughs> that is how that worked out. But when I when I mean when I talked to his pediatrician, eventually um, the pediatrician said that pretty much every kid that had been seen at that office had gained like an extra ten to twenty pounds. Um, that they probably wouldn't have had they been in PE three times a week, walking back and forth to school, going to the park to play with their friends, all that kind of stuff. So that was pretty devastating. I think a lot of us probably experienced pandemic weight gain. It was sad. So, so given your opinions on the government enforcing lockdowns, what do you think about government-enforced vaccines? I'm not in favor of um, government enforcing very much, frankly. Um, I wasn't in favor of government enforcement of vaccines and limiting people's movement based on whether or not they had taken those vaccines, um, especially once um, vaccines had been made available to everyone. Once everyone had access to vaccines and it had been a few months, it did not seem reasonable to restrict the movements of people who had chosen not to get vaccinated. Um, I got COVID while I was vaccinated and uh, I went and I got monoclonal antibodies and <laughs> like I did the whole thing. I was like, I wanna see what this is about. Um, but yeah, I don't think that it was appropriate to have that kind of government enforcement. Now, if you look back in the 20th century, we did have enforced polio vaccines. I, think they, I don't think that there, anybody's movement was restricted if they didn't get the polio vaccine, I'm not sure. Um, but that was a far more dangerous disease um, you know, we even had a president who got it and was then paralyzed because of it. Um, and if you look back at the control of viruses, it's interesting. There were leper colonies. People with plague were isolated. And there's definitely a question to be asked as to how to control diseases. Um, I don't think we did a great job with this one. And I think a lot of why we didn't do a great job with this one is because the first answers that were come up with by the government were just assumed to be correct and then enforced. There wasn't a lot of public conversation about it. Um, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our rights were just totally squashed. Therefore, next time it's going to be even easier to take our rights away, I think. Anyone else? Yeah. Lauren, um, I think there have been and there probably will be instances in the future where government power or at least some sort of organized community power to do massive things, lock down, everyone has to stay inside, everyone has to get some sort of uh, medical treatment. I think that has existed in history and it will exist in the future. 
But when it comes to COVID, I don't think that is one of those crises. And you know how you can tell? Because every other time the government has said, hey, get in your homes, do this, do that, when it's been bombs dropping, people do it. There's not a debate. No one's sitting around like, oh, I don't know, maybe. I haven't seen anyone die from it. No, they're like, holy shit, there's bombs dropping from the sky. Let's go do this. Or you're seeing mass deaths or something. COVID just was not that experience for many of us. I still don't know anyone personally who has died from COVID. I don't. Like, it's, it is still so controversial with the average person that I, I don't think the government really have the authority to be telling us what to put in our bodies, to be telling us where we can and can't go. And what I think happened there, because I, I still don't think they have the popular support or did at any point for what they did, is the tail was wagging the dog with the media. The media were telling politicians and the public what they need to be afraid of, what they need to panic about, what they need to do. And we know this because at the very beginning of COVID, even when it was spreading, the media were saying, don't worry about it. And everyone was like, oh, okay. And then suddenly, freak out. Everyone starts panicking. Um, and politicians didn't want to get bad press. So they just started doing what the media told them to do. I think this was massively a tail wagging the dog situation. What country do you guys think had the, the best response? And we're probably going to have different answers here, but the best response and, and maybe the worst response, if you have an opinion on yeah. that. Every third world country. <laughs> had we best. got work to do. <laughs> what? Disease? Sorry. I'm going to starve to death. I got to go do something. <laughs> like... You're saying they had the best response. <laughs> kind of, no. <laughs> I would have preferred to live there. I, I'd say uh, the lockdown, personally for me, the lockdown messed up my life way more than anything to do with the disease ever did. But I can understand people that are like, I want some policy, especially elderly homes, that kind of stuff. The best response would have been Band-Aid response, but you lock down vulnerable populations. And everyone else who's not vulnerable gets to go out and about, in my opinion. I don't know if anyone did that specifically. I'd have to look into it more. Some of that maybe. was done in Scandinavian countries. Yeah. Um, and I think the countries that did not close schools probably, I mean, I'm a parent, you know, so that's my thing. But I think the countries that didn't did not close schools probably did the best response. Um, I think Sweden actually was one of those that um, tried to protect the vulnerable while letting everybody else do what they wanted and also didn't, uh, didn't close schools. They did, I think, for a short period of time, but then got them open pretty fast. Um, I think that's probably the better response, protecting the vulnerable, letting kids go about their lives, especially since they did not have um, high instances of mortality due to this disease. Go ahead. The government stripping away people's rights doesn't sit well with me, so I'm going to say that no country that did that handled th this well. Um, and in regards to which country handled it worse, I mean, look at what was happening in Australia, in New Zealand. Look what was happening to people in Canada. Okay, you had people that were protesting the lockdowns that got thrown in jail. I mean... Their bank accounts frozen? Their bank accounts frozen, exactly. You had people in China whose cats are being thrown in bags right now for COVID protection. So, uh, you know, there were a majority of countries that handled this extremely uh, poorly New here Zealand in America, again, too. Yeah, exactly. A again, in America, too, we're, we're arresting people that are walking outside alone on the beach. What about Florida? Is Florida a country? They did a good if job. If Florida was a country, they probably handled it the best, I guess. I don't know. Ron DeSantis still set a uh, uh, what was the word I was looking for? Yeah, shut them down for you know a small period of time. And um, uh, you know I am very right-wing, but even with Donald Trump, I don't even agree with his Operation Warp Speed and the fact that he pushed that on people and that we were uh, looking for vaccination to be the point of uh, you know how we get out of this when it has been so ineffective. But again, you know look at our Health Secretary of America right now. It's a man pretending to be a woman, just you know so we're all aware of where basic science is in America in the modern day. <laughs> The vaccine has been highly effective, thank you. Um, I think South Korea probably did the best. They, it was an incredibly dense country. Um, they really, really aggressively did the contact tracing stuff. I don't think their shutdowns were as harsh as New Zealand or Australia, but I haven't read about them recently. But it seemed like in terms of numbers and in terms of comparable countries to like really highly dense country and having very, very low infection rates, it feels like South Korea probably did the best. How do you guys uh, think that celebrities held up under this pandemic? This is a question those, we might have some unsung heroes, truly the most Hollywood affected. celebrities. Sorry. I was just quoting The Simpsons. Sorry. Oh, I was just a joke question. How do you think celebrities, think about, think of the celebrities, oh, how they do. Do you remember when they all sang Imagine 
remotely. COVID was actually from their beautiful after that. That's, from their that's, beautiful that's, locations. Yeah, I was that, just that's like, why COVID fuck stopped off. Because like, the celebrity I'm, sang I'm to us. I'm in a one-bedroom apartment. Like, shut up. <laughs> that made me so annoyed. I do, I do have one final serious question before, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, when the history is written about these past two COVID years, what story do you think they're going to tell, and what story do you think they should tell? And I'll start with you, Destiny. Well, I, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I think that if I had to guess, I think probably the two, probably the biggest thing that is going to be followed is going to be the educational gaps. Um, I think they've already talked about seeing, like, you're going to see going through the years, like, longitudinally kids that were locked out of school for two years um, weren't able to be educated. Um, and they're going to be, like, either IQ drops or lack of educational attainment or job problems. I think that's going to be something you'll see for sure. Um, and then secondly, probably would be that the economic measures were too aggressive for the stimulus given. Um, that needed to be balanced out better. I think that the, the story of the United States is probably that there was no coherent top-down approach for dealing with everything. I think if there would have been a coherent approach, even if you're for or against lockdowns or whatever, I think we all would have been happier for it. If you're gonna shut down a lot of businesses, like there has to be appropriate compensation. Not everybody can just hole up in their apartment for you know two years or work remotely at Google or something and make enough money to be okay. And it seems like that, it, it just wasn't addressed as well as it should have been on the government end for the economic measures that they did restrict people of. And then the third story will be uh, how uh, crazy we became about vaccinations. I never thought that I would see anti-vaxxers rise again uh, as much as they have, uh, especially when that used to be only like a really weird hippie left-wing thing. But now I guess conservatives are at full swing with thinking that pharmaceutical companies are trying to poison you with Fauci's vaccines. Savannah. First off, I uh, think that it's really funny how being anti-lockdown and anti-mandate, anti-forced vaccination is now being anti-vax, especially when this vaccination has no long-term research. Usually vaccinations have about 10 years of research behind them before they're released to the public. This was the most quickly developed vaccine in history. Again, young children dying from myocarditis from this. I have listened to these stories of multiple parents who have cried because their child is dead after getting the COVID vaccine. No shot. I don't believe you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Great. Of course Again, you don't the, believe the me. Rates of myocarditis, you don't look into the rates of myocarditis. Are Anyways, so now it's my turn to talk, low. so I'm not okay, letting it's you speak. Right right the story right? that's going to be told is that Donald Trump was a bad leader and that COVID got so out of control because of his bad leadership and it got so much better under Biden, even though if you look at the natural progression of a virus and natural immunity, the reason why we are where we are today with the COVID rates is because everyone finally got it. Lockdowns were ridiculous and any Republican as well or conservative who advocated for forced vaccination or lockdown, I think is just not based in science in, in any way, shape, or form. So the story that's going to be written is that Donald Trump was a horrible leader. He's going to get a lot of the blame for that. And then, um, of, of course, you know, Joe Biden came in and just really made everything great with vaccinations and face masks. Uh, so uh, great job there. Thank you. Louis? I think we'll probably just get a couple of sentences, and that's about it. Uh, nobody knew about the Spanish flu or cared even remotely until this. And then everyone was like, oh, there was the Spanish flu. Um, so yeah, it'll probably be something like in 2020, there was a pandemic, it swept the globe, this many people died. Uh, it was addressed with lockdowns, a vaccine was made quickly. And that will, I, I believe that will be it. That will be the sum total of our era. That's my thought. <laughs> Lauren. Um, more recent history, we're already seeing the uh, shutting down of all these lockdown policies and mask policies as we speak, literally this week, the end of the airline mask policy. And I think a large part of that is because of Putin, obviously, stealing the limelight like such a diva and COVID just doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and politicians are going to start to feel comfortable dropping these policies, knowing they aren't going to get this massive heat. And what the narrative will then become will be, oh, okay, we, uh, we did it. We did it. All of these policies we put in place, they were successful. Although there's going to be trickling research that comes out saying, ah, not so true. They'll just stick with that narrative. It was successful. We got through it. Now we can lift everything up. Then they'll let the rest of COVID run its course as it was anyways while all these policies were in place. Um, and then later in the future, depending how far, I do think if we're going to honestly look back on it, no one had any idea what they were doing. Everything was all over the place. This is also why I, I don't even know if there can be a question of, oh, let's hold people accountable. Let's hold them. I, I think that there are a lot of politicians that 
genuinely wanted to do their best but had no idea. So they were listening to health experts, who some of which genuinely wanted to do their best but had no idea, going back and forth on policy, so much new research coming out. Then you had a lot of politicians just wanting to save face with the media, look good. We don't want numbers coming out before elections saying I killed grandma. Um, but looking back on it, it'll be these people had no idea what they were doing. They were flip-flopping on policies back and forth. They seriously effed up a lot of people's lives by just trying to throw everything at the wall and flailing at it. And you know what? Uh, now we're reaping the repercussions of this two-year, three-year economic disaster, education disaster, unfortunately. Could we have done it better? Probably, but we're humans, so we kind of suck at everything. Do you know what's, what's interesting is we were, I was talking about the polio vaccine. You guys weren't. I was. Um, the polio vaccine was tested on 1.8 million children, for, and then a year later it was declared effective. I wonder how we would have reacted if the vaccine, if this, the COVID vaccine was tested on some 2 million children for a year. No placebo was given during the, during the polio vaccine. How would we have reacted to 2 million children being tested upon by, pharmaceutical, by you know, Pfizer and then having the vaccine declared safe. I don't think we would have gone for it. And I wonder if perhaps our uh, ancestors of the 20th century were a little more resilient than we are now. Can we have a round of applause for our panelists? Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna open it up for questions. If you guys can line up at the mic here with Fritz. Again, please, one question and no long-winded personal narratives. Uh, this question is for Destiny. How long do you intend to, or wish to have this mandate and for lockdowns and masks? Because already got the vaccine. Enough people are getting vaccines. When is it going to end? I think that the goal was always to control like the flow of people into the hospital. I know that the conservative talking point is that like Ukraine is the reason why we forgot about mandates and now they're lifting mandates for whatever them whatever that story is. But I, I think what happened was in the last surge that we had of Omicron, I think everybody knows somebody or multiple people they got sick. Like that was the first time that I even remember looking at my chat. People were saying that like their offices had like 20% of the employees were there or like half of college classrooms were just empty because of everybody getting sick. So I think that like the combination of all of the people that had already gotten sick, all the vaccines that had already happened and then the Omicron coming in and getting basically everybody else sick was probably gonna be the natural ending point for the, um, for the entire pandemic. Um, so I mean like if the cases are down, which they seem like they are, yeah, then you can start lifting stuff and yeah, moving forward. Um, I'd just be interested in what any of you uh, have, have to say about this. I guess my, the question is, when we say what should we do and what are policies, uh, when should we lock down, what I don't think I'm hearing is the question, do we believe that the federal government has a moral or constitutional right to tell us when we can leave our houses? when we can cross state lines, and when we have to wear a certain article of clothing. I obviously don't believe the government has those rights under any circumstances, but I would be curious to know what everybody else thought. Yeah, I, I don't think so at all either. I don't think the federal government has that right, and I think neither, a lot of judges don't think the federal government has that right either, or state governments have that right. So that's pretty interesting. I don't think some of those suggestions are always a bad idea in the face of certain things, you know, existential crises to your country, invasion, the government wanting to tell you to do things. But as I mentioned earlier, I think it should be such a threat that people will do them voluntarily. With government, you know, offering some sort of incentive, sure, but there should be a voluntary aspect of that because everyone agrees this is a threat to all of us. Beer and hot dogs incentive? Sorry, the, what? They were giving out beer and hot dogs? Uh, yeah, yeah, beer, beer and hot dogs, fat burger and fries for, uh, for a vaccine. Jeez. Next question. All right, so in 2020, during the lockdowns, during the thick of it, um, my father had a tumor growing in his neck, which got bigger and bigger, and he could not go to the hospital to get this looked at because the hospitals were refusing all care to anyone who was not a COVID patient to save those beds for this large influx of patients in cases that actually didn't show up. It wasn't until late June that he was able to finally get it looked at, get it diagnosed, get to surgery, all of that. And the doctor even told him that if he had waited just a little bit longer, he would not have made it. 
So it made me wonder how many other people did not have their cancers or other illnesses diagnosed during the thick of the lockdowns in 2020. And my question is for Stephen. Are you willing to acknowledge that lockdowns actually killed people from increased suicides, overdoses, mental illness, undiagnosed illnesses? I find it interesting that you're only willing to tout this million people died from COVID number, but you won't acknowledge a single death outside of COVID caused by these lockdown policies. Are you willing to acknowledge that lockdowns actually killed people in some circumstances? Yeah, of course. I, like, I, I don't know where this delusion comes from that like, oh, you only want to acknowledge one side of the problem when conservatives are the ones that do that. Like, you guys are the ones that have this problem where you'll talk about like the 2% the increase in like domestic violence. And then when I show you like a million dead people from COVID, you're like, well, I think those numbers are fake. Those people were all fat anyway, right? So it's like, I, I mean, yeah, I'll acknowledge that there are costs to what we did for the lockdown. I don't think anybody would deny, I don't think anybody would deny that. that Okay, yeah. You just did a but what about conservatives instead of just answering Yeah, because that's question. where the conversation is. I don't know is. a single conservative that says no one died from COVID. Did, she literally she just the numbers said the numbers are were, She said the numbers were inflated and they have been proven how many, how many people do you think died of COVID for real? I told you, and I never said that the numbers were faked, so that in itself was I don't think she's going to answer that question. I said that I think that the numbers were over-reported. So what do you think the actual numbers are? I don't know, because, but I don't what, think like, that... What, like, ballpark it? I'm not going to give you an answer. Okay, I'm, I'm that's not what going I thought. Okay, that, so that, this is what I'm talking what you, about, what right? This is the problem, do? okay? You want so, me to give like, you some answer and some statistics that you can use and, like, give me a gotcha with you, but when, when push comes to shove, oh, and, and again, like, the fact that you actually do trust the government so willingly is baffling to me, and I don't understand it. I, I don't think that the We're, government would have given us realistic statistics about who did die. I think that it is overreported, and it was overreported to scare us into giving up our rights and freedoms, giving the government more power over our lives, which we willingly saw. I mean, look where, at... Where, where, the, do you get, where did you get your numbers for increase of people in suicidality or mental illness? So I've actually, this is my thing, right? I'm a journalist, so I actually go out and talk to people on the streets of no, America. So that, your so research is you went out and you talked to everybody. Because I thought you, we didn't oh like God. interrupting people here. You interrupted me so many times. But the reality is, is you like the data that you trust. No. And then you did, so then you're I telling don't, me. I don't believe so any data So you were able statistics. to ascertain the so mental health the of the United States by going out right and talking now. to He's people. He's trying to put words in my mouth. He's I'm not putting words in your mouth. I asked you a question. I don't trust any data or statistics because I think that they are all manipulated no matter what we are talking about. It's very, very easy to manipulate a statistic or data. So when it comes to suicide rates, when it comes to the rates of myocarditis and pericarditis for the vaccine, I think that any statistic or data can be uh, manipulated like I just said. So whether it is a pro or anti-COVID argument, I don't believe the data. Then how do you have any opinion on any of this at all? Because I go out on the streets of America and I actually go talk to my fellow American who said my child killed themselves because of lockdown. Because I actually go and talk to the parents who said my child died from myocarditis. Because I've actually gone out on the streets of America and seen this with my own two eyes. I understand that data and statistics, of course, are important and they give us a basis for where we're at. But I also think that they can be very easily manipulated to, manipulated to push a government narrative. Look at the entire mainstream media, okay? Look who they are owned by. Look who they are funded by. They... I mean, for example, with COVID, we saw CNN, MSNBC, all of these people were sponsored by Big Pharma push a specific narrative. Of course, every single piece of data and statistic is manipulated. We have I'm a nation I'm of over... interrupt just because we've got a long line. Okay. I'm sure we can continue this with some of these questions anyway. Yeah. Next one. Yeah, this is... I apologize for introducing more data into the conversation, but... Damn it! Uh, but this is from the CDC. Um, websites, multiple different studies. Uh, I'm, I'm going to cite some data and then ask a question. Uh, and it's about masking children in schools. So in 2018, the flu killed 480 children um, the, during the flu season. Um, 2021, uh, 2020 to 2021, 19-month period, uh, 361 children uh, died of COVID. So um, we're talking about a longer period of time, less, fewer deaths in children. The cases are also the same, uh, fewer, fewer cases, fewer hospitalization rates uh, for COVID versus the flu. Um, and then we have uh, issues with cloth, ma cloth masks. Um, a lot of kids going to school with like Star Wars masks that they got on Etsy or whatever and not really doing anything um, statistically. Um, what, what are your thoughts on the government? Did they go too far in mandating students wearing masks or else they were sent home versus 
the giving the parents the option to keep their kids home if they if they're paranoid about that versus um, basically kicking kids out of schools if, if they don't want to comply. There there was a lot going on with that, <laughs> um, and a lot of what was going on with that were teachers and teachers unions making their determinations about what they felt comfortable with. So a lot of teachers. Um, Teachers' unions made demands that there would be masks on students, and that's a big part of the reason why they were in place in, at all, uh, was to get schools open, you had to get teachers to agree to come back to work, and to get teachers to agree to come back to work, you had to meet some of their concerns and address some of their fears as well. So that's why, um, I think that's why the masking was on children. Um, teachers wanted to wear masks. Uh, kids mostly did not want to wear masks. There was something very interesting, though. I had a babysitter recently. She's a high school student. And I was asking her. It was right after the mask mandate was lifted for school children in New York. Um, and I said, hey, is everyone done masking at your school? And she said, well, at first, as soon as the mask mandate was lifted, everyone came in with their faces free. And they didn't wear masks. And a lot of girls started getting made fun of. Uh, boys were like, oh, you have acne. And so the next day, a bunch of girls came to school with masks on, and they haven't taken them off. And it was a self-consciousness thing. Um, I don't think the government should have been mandating that necessarily. There are still schools, like I know the UN school, which is like $65,000 a year. They're still requiring masks. New York City public schools are not. Um, but kids can wear them if they want to, which I think is reasonable. Uh, I will just say, though, there was recently a report in The Guardian. The CDC had a coding error, which led to an overcount of 72,000 COVID deaths. So that's what I was looking at before. Um, and I think, you know, that's 72,000 COVID deaths that were overreported. That's all. Thank you. I just want to say I respect everybody on the stage um, greatly. I've seen you guys on multiple videos and appreciate that. I guess my question is for Destiny. Whenever you say that lockdowns work or mask mandates work, how did it go from 15 days to stop the spread to in North Texas specifically, we did six weeks uh, of lockdowns, which were very lenient compared to most other states, and then mask mandates for a year and a half. And to say that those worked, it, like that lockdowns, once you did lockdowns, that everything fell off the face of the earth, or, or excuse me, that there was a very um, decreased amount of cases. Why did we have to go through such a long extended period of time if those were so effective? Um, I think there were two huge things at play. One is I think the virus is more infectious than people originally thought, so just doing some things wasn't going to cut it. And two, I think that in the United States especially, it seemed like in a lot of areas there were a lot of half measures kind of taken and going back and forth and back and forth. So we were in like the worst of both worlds where people on the left were mad because they felt like the lockdowns weren't stringent enough. People on the right were mad because there were some lockdowns that were being enforced and it was enough to like shut down businesses and make everybody mad. So it seemed like in the United States, just because of our lack of like top-down approach, we had a really hard time committing to one effective strategy. So we kind of wound up with like the worst of both. We had a really infectious virus and like really half-assed measures that we took all across the United States to deal with it. Okay. Next question. Yeah. So I just want to ask um, if, uh, if the vaccine is so bad, right, why did Trump take the vaccine as soon as possible and not only that recommended to take the vaccine? Also, why did Fox News mandate their employees to take the vaccine as well? I would say that I was against Donald Trump's entire Operation Warp Speed. And also, do we seriously think that Joe Biden and Donald Trump are getting the same exact vaccine that we are? Come on, guys. I, I don't think it's a question of the vaccine being bad or not. It's when it comes to the vaccine mandates and who has to or who doesn't have to take it. When you're asking the public to do something forcibly that big for their health, there has to be a bit of trust there. And unfortunately, health officials lost that trust very quickly. You can wear masks. Oh, no, you shouldn't. You should. Uh, one week, two week, three weeks, two years, right? There was just a complete lack of trust. And I don't think you can ask people to take a vaccine that was created so quickly, as Savannah pointed out, usually 10-year process to test a vaccine for long-term effects. That's a big ask for someone whose trust you've already lost. I kind of thought that the Operation Warp Speed was a really cool idea. He enlisted. Um what, like six companies to make three different kinds of vaccine, two on each sort of, you know, technique of making vaccines. 
Um, I appreciated it. I thought it was uh, I thought it was a great way to handle it. Um, and I think it's a shame that it you know that the vaccines get so trashed now just because they aren't as effective as we all would like. I think it was a really solid effort. Um, hi, um, I have a question for uh, Destiny specifically. Um, why should I, as a healthy young person, be excluded from a job, uh, a high paying job at a company because I don't have the vaccine? Why should I be excluded from that if I'm a young and healthy dude? I mean, I, I would have to know the company policy. If they have vaccine mandates, then I mean, that's the company policy. But um, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how I feel about I think that if they wanted to do the vaccine, well, I see that there's arguments against it. But like, I think having some sort of test for prior infections would have been nice. Because if you were infected before, there is going to be some immunity conferred there. Same thing if you're vaccinated. I don't know why they didn't honor um, prior infections. So. That is a super weird thing. I don't know. Yeah, that was think, frustrating all throughout that that natural immunity wasn't considered to be an issue. Like after I got COVID and then I got the monoclonal antibodies and I talked to my doctor about it and he was like, you're pretty much solid now because you have natural immunity and all of this other stuff. You're good for a good long time. But if I were to say, you know, just have the natural immunity, then I wasn't going to be allowed to eat dinner out at a restaurant. I think the worry was that if you said that natural immunity was good, people would start having like, I don't know if you guys ever had like chicken pox parties growing up where you basically get everybody together and you all get sick so that you have the thing and you're over it. I, that was the thing when I was growing up. So maybe people were worried about encouraging that type of mentality. Okay, in uh, spring of 2020, I was uh, going to the CDC and tracking uh, COVID stats and flu. Until April, the flu stats disappeared. The page even disappeared. Is it possible that somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of COVID deaths were actually flu? If you look at the CDC data there um, on COVID deaths, there's COVID deaths, and then there's also um, total respiratory infection deaths. There's pneumonia deaths as well, and they're all separated out. I don't see flu on there, but I, they, they did do a pretty good job, I think, of differentiating, the, differentiating those, those areas anyway. I don't know what you guys have to say about that. So in regards to myo and pericarditis caused by the vaccine, I think something along the lines of why should we submit our children to permanent heart damage was set on the panel. So is it actually the case that myo and pericarditis caused by the vaccine is actually chronic and not acute? No, it's an acute condition. It's just inflammation of the, either the heart or like the muscles surrounding the heart. Um, it's, not, it's not a chronic condition. Um, hi, I'm a teacher here in Fort Worth, so like this is super local for me, but um, low-income neighborhoods were affected the most from the lockdowns and the mandates. Obviously, that makes sense because when you have consistent transportation outside of the city and you have more access to different groups of people, um, as well as parents at home who are educated and can read to you and read with you and even homeschool you, a lot of parents decided to homeschool um, after the pandemic ended, I guess. Um, they just had the advantage during the lockdowns, the higher-income families. Now we're seeing babies and toddlers have horrible speech delays that are pretty much undeniable at this point. They're doing a lot more studies on it. And we're seeing at our schools a uh, huge regression in behavior to the point where there's lots of assaults that are happening at our schools, um, from kids as young as six all the way up to 11 years old at my school. Um, are there any solutions to this, do you think? And who's going to be blamed for this in the next 10 to 20 years? I don't know what the solutions are. I, I, I can't imagine that the school stuff was written by anybody with kids. I don't know how you could ever imagine sticking a third grader in front of an iPad for eight hours, and that would be like the same as going to school. Um, I, I think that the, the education stuff was really bad on two fronts. Um, one was the lack of education that happened because kids weren't caught up when they were doing these one to two years of distance learning. It just doesn't work with, with, with children. That's one big thing. And then a second big thing that you rightly point out is economically, for a lot of people, you're like saving grace is when your kid gets old enough to go to school so that you have another parent freed up to go and work. And babysitting and daycare, that stuff is really expensive. And when you've pulled a lot of people out of jobs, when you've got people staying at home watching their children, um, it's setting people behind economically and then like you said, behaviorally and educationally as well. I think the, the school stuff, uh, which I think I, I don't know how much it, it would probably differ from state to state, but I think the school stuff was probably the worst that we did during the pandemic. I, I could be wrong, but I feel like even early on, I thought that Fauci was saying that like, this is probably not something that needs to stay because it was so disastrous across the United States for families and children. 
you don't. Oh. Oh. I think that um, probably what's needed is an increase in special ed teachers, occupational therapists, speech therapists, um, and that maybe we should do a bunch of funding for IEPs and to get kids specialized instruction. Um, I know that that's certainly something that's helped kids in our district is having that extra instruction. Uh, one thing that's been a shame though is we had um, a lot of, we had like catch-ups, like there's been after school programs and before school programs for catch-ups. And I really wanted these for specifically for academics, for math, for science to just, you know, get that all back on track. And I got a call from my son's school. They said, oh, he, you know, he's eligible to come in for this program. Um, and there was the academic, <laughs> And it was like a before school thing. And I said, oh, great, is this math? What are we doing? You know, what's the catch up? And they said, no, it's for social emotional learning. And I was like, no, I want academic catch up. Socially, he's fine. Emotionally, he's great. You know, these are not issues we're having, uh, but we could use some help with fractions. Do you have anything for that? And the answer was not really. So I think that uh, the emphasis in education across the board needs to be back on academics instead of constantly, this is my parental position, you know, I'm not a teacher, but needs to be a lot more back on rigor and um, academic value and holding kids to high academic standards. I think that kids really achieve when they are held to high expectations and they know what the goals are and are given the tools to reach them and then they feel good and then they go on and they can succeed. Um, but we're pandering to these kids and I think that that's, we're like, oh, you're so far behind. Let's have a hug. And it's like, nah, no, no, let's just work on the fractions. Um, you asked who's gonna be held accountable for this and I think 100% without a doubt, on, on this front at least with education, the media. Because it wasn't the science, it wasn't Fauci, even Stephen admitted that much. The, everyone kind of agrees to an extent that is looking at the data anyways, kids were not being affected by this. They were pretty okay. Uh, so you look at where is this coming from, and a lot of people look at right-wingers and say, oh, look at these crazy QAnon jumping up and down, freaking out about vaccines. But you got the left-wing version of people putting masks on their newborns, people uh, needing to keep their kids indoors, not leaving their house to even go to the park for years. And that's a hysteria that absolutely was caused by the media. There is no doubt that fears about this virus, especially towards young people and children, were massively overhyped by the media to the point that politicians were making decisions about children's lives and their schooling that was counter to the data they oh so worshipped. So yeah, I think it's going to be the media. Final question. I find it concerning how the legacy media has hijacked the word conspiracy, and I, I feel we should nip this in the butt if we were to have better discourses from here on out. Uh, as far as I'm aware, conspiracy means a small group of people who, um, who plan to commit an unlawful act to, pers to pursue their agenda, whatever that may be. Uh, so my question is, uh, if the Wuhan lab theory is true, if China's uh, government has let out the virus out on purpose, but it's, if that turns out to be true, is it still a conspiracy? I mean, there's, there's two definitions for conspiracy. One is, as you've pointed out, a conspiracy is like a plot by a group of people to usually perform an illegal act. When people talk about a conspiracy theory, usually the implication is there's like a, a small, there's like a group of people that are secretly, covertly doing something that there's no evidence for. That's why we went. So I think when people say like conspiracy theory, it's usually used as like a slur, or like derogatorily, but it doesn't actually refer to like an actual conspiracy. Like criminal conspiracies exist. So if China did conspire to do that, that would be like a conspiracy, but it wouldn't be like a conspiracy theory, I guess. Can we have a round of applause for our panelists, guys? Thank you. Can I take a short break? And then we'll be back. All right, we're going to have a 10-minute break. 